My name is Maimona Afsalberta. I am a, a special education teacher in San Jose, and I'm also on a local school board as an elected official. Um, so we're going to be talking about stereotypes, um, and stereotypes impact Muslims in a lot of ways, right? I'm sure a lot of you have experienced them or witnessed them, um, but they also impact a lot of other groups of individuals. And so it's important that we learn about and specifically reflect on the negative ex the ne negative impact of stereotypes, but also how we can take back some of that power um, so that we can counteract the stereotypes that do exist um, in our society and communities. So we're going to start by actually looking at some of the historical examples. Um, from the Sira and from the early believers. And so to do that activity, um, well, actually, let me backtrack. Did you all get a copy of the agenda? They don't have a copy? Okay. So I'll go ahead and uh, read the agenda and goals then just so you know what to expect. So this session, again, is going to cover the personal experience. It's going to cover stereotypes. Um, the relationship between stereotypes, policies, and real-world consequences. And then some of the goals are we're going to discuss and process different interpersonal experiences with stereotypes. We're going to reflect on the ways that all of you as students, uh, Muslim students specifically, can be recipients but also perpetuators of specific stereotypes. Um, and we're going to understand how those uh, stereotypes also perpetuate unjust policies against marginalized communities um, and how the, that knowledge operates in a larger system of oppression. And then hopefully by the end of this, you'll be able to generate kind of a thesis statement which articulates different platforms for combating oppression as individuals and as a broader community. So that's just to give you an idea of uh, what to expect uh, in the agenda. And don't worry, I'm not having you write an essay at the end of this. I'll leave that up to Brother Osman if he uh, wants to challenge you with that. I did see the thesis statement, but I don't believe that's part of a, an activity yet. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, so we're going to go ahead and do uh, read, uh, I'll re go ahead and read a story. Um, but before we do that, I would like for you to check under your desk um, to see if you have a card um, stuck under your desk somewhere. So if you have a card, or under the, oh, on top of your desk. Okay, perfect. If you have a, not the sticky note, not the sticky note but an actual card, yes. I see a couple of you. Perfect. So if you have a, a piece of paper uh, with a term and a definition, when I come across that term in the story, I would like for you to um, read the, the term, the word, and its definition so that we all have um, the same understanding of what that word means. Okay, so you should all have a copy of the story, though. Do you all have that? That's what I'm going to be reading off of to start us off. Okay, and then do we have all of the cards? I think I saw a couple. There's not too many, but everyone who has a card? Okay. Oh, okay. So I'm going to... I'm going to ask you to read that, please. Thank you. OK. So we'll go ahead and get started. We're going to be reading the, the elite of Quraysh and the early believers. Again, to give us some context, right? Why as Muslims is it so important? And what does the Sira teach us about this? The Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, came from the tribe of Quraysh the most powerful and prestigious tribe in the Arabian Peninsula. Their status as keepers of the Kaaba and caretakers of the pilgrims who visited the holy site every year gave Quraysh authority and legitimacy. The pilgrim, pilgrimage was also a big source of revenue for the business leaders of Quraysh, who sold souvenir idols and other goods to the pilgrims. Hence, idol worship was a source of power and money for the leaders of the Quraysh. It was no wonder that then that they felt threatened when the prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, called for the worship of one God. This threatened the entire social, political, and economic power structure of the elite. 
It's no surprise that the early community of Muslims faced all kinds of accusations and stereotypes. So who has stereotypes? On the people's paper, can you go ahead and read us what stereotypes mean, please? Thank you for reading it, that to us. So stereotypes to delegitimize de their cause. The prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, was called a fortune teller, a poet, a liar, and a sorcerer whose words could tear families apart. The leaders of Quraysh looked upon the early Muslims with suspicions and distrust, believing that their Islam threatened the very fabric of society. Arguably, the tribal elites created the first atmosphere of Islamophobia. Who has the term Islamophobia for us? Yes, can you read that out loud for us, please? Islamophobia refers to unfounded fear of or hostility towards Islam and Islam. Such fear and hostility leads to discrimination against Muslims, the exclusion of Muslims from mainstream, mainstream political or social contact, stereotyping, guilt by association, and racism. Thank you. So it created the first atmosphere of Islamophobia, which was used to justify the harsh treatment of early Muslims. Quraysh operated a system of tribal alliances, so if you messed with a member of the powerful clan, then you were basically asking for tribal war. Having tribal alliances with the rich and powerful meant having physical protection. Hence the people without those alliances, without that protection, the slaves, servants, and immigrants of Mecca received the worst discrimination. Who has discrimination? Yes, can you please read that for us? Okay. Thank you, brother. Unequal treatment of people based on their membership in a group to discriminate is to treat a person not on the basis of who they are, but on the basis of a prejudgment about a group. Discrimination can describe treatment under the law, like segre segregation laws, or against the law, like hate crimes. Thank you for reading that. So they received the worst discrimination when the leaders of the Quraysh decided that they would no longer tolerate the practice of Islam. Sumayya and her husband Yasser were the first martyrs in Islam. They were poor, Sumaya, a servant, and her husband Yasser, an immigrant from Yemen. Upon accepting Islam, they were tortured and eventually killed, with no tribal connections to protect them. One can argue that Sumaya and her husband Yasser were the victims of classism. Who has classism? Okay, so bring the mic over, and then if you could read the definition of classism, please. Um, any attitude, action, or institutional practice that subordinates people due to their economic condition. A person's class is determined by access to a mix of resources, including, but not limited to money, culture, contacts, and formal education. Class includes food, clothing, language, cars, entertainment, work, and much more. Thank you. Bilal, may Allah be pleased with him, was a black slave from Abyssinia. His talent and integrity earned him the confidence of his slave owner, Umayyah ibn Khalaf, who entrusted Bilal to manage his trade and goods. His refined character and tremendous recitation of poetry surpassed many of Mecca's elites. But because Bilal was the son of a black woman, he would never be accepted among the leaders of the Quraysh. Upon learning that Bilal had become Muslim, Umayyah placed burning desert rocks on his flesh and subjected him to extreme torture to get him to renounce his faith. In legendary defiance, he repeated over and over again, Ahadun Ahad, Allah is one, Allah is one. Bilal's experiences illustrate the depth of society's institutionalized racism. Who has the word racism?
Racism is a system of oppression used to the advantage of one race and the disadvantage of another race or races. It involves the use of institutional power to reiterate stereotypes and enforce dis discrimination in systemic ways. Thank you for reading that, that uh, definition of racism. You see, Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, understood that these stereotypes were a mask for the real fears of Mecca's elite. In a society that worshipped wealth, tribal connections, and whiteness, la ilaha illallah, there is no God but God, meant abandoning these false idols that gave the elite of Quraysh their power in Meccan society. Islam came as the newest and baddest form of knowledge power. Who has knowledge power? Yes. A knowledge power refers to the idea that if you can influence the knowledge that people adopt through media, education, pop culture, and other social mediums, then you can influence how power is exercised either ethically or unethically, stereotypes are a negative form of knowledge power which work to advantage certain groups and disadvantage others. Thank you for reading that definition. So Islam gave us that knowledge power in the Arabian Peninsula. It's no wonder then that many of the earliest and most dedicated believers were servants, slaves, women, and youth, supposedly the weakest people in society. So that gives us some context for our for our lesson today, right? I want you to go ahead and turn to like a person sitting next to you, whoever's uh, closest, maybe, and maybe and let's let's talk about this a little bit. Talk to them about in this story how are the ideas about groups of people related to the systems that mistreat people. So I'll say that one more time. I want you to turn and talk to them about how the ideas about groups of people are related to the systems that mistreat people. So go ahead and turn and talk. I'll give you guys a couple of minutes just to process what we read. Okay. Free a brave soul and share what you processed with your partner. Um, basically what I thought that I understood from this was that the people in the tribe with the higher social hierarchy or the people with the higher status were more were less likely to accept Islam because their idol worship was kind of it was sort of a thing that got them to their higher status so they were less likely to give that up for Islam because then they'd lose that status. Yeah, that's a great connection, right? There was there was so much that they were gaining financially from their social status that would be a great loss to them if they decided to go against, right? Because it's all about the connections you had. So if you're gonna go against that, then it would jeopardize your position. Thank you for sharing that connection. Okay, so before we get into an acti another activity, what I wanna actually do is, you might be wondering like, okay, well, why did Brother Usman or why did Care pick me to do this session? Um, like, who am I and why, why, is this, like, why is this such a big deal to me? Well, I would argue that stereotypes actually drastically change the trajectory of my life. And I'm not saying that as an exaggeration. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about my story, um, specifically with stereotypes. And really, I feel like I had experienced them as, you know, like a, as a student. Um, I went to an Islamic school in Sunnyvale. And so I, I, I was always around a lot of Muslim. My peers were always Muslim. Um, but when, when I became a teacher and decided to teach in the public school, um, that was some of my first experiences. So I had been teaching about um, four years at the time and as a special education teacher. And so most of my time spent on a public middle school campus working with students with learning disabilities. Um, and so at the time, again, working there for about four or five years, um, I, I honestly was doing great. It was, you know, things got tough sometimes. You know, you've all been middle schoolers, so you understand. It's, sometimes it can be a little bit difficult to work with. But I would say my life really changed on 9-11-2017 when I came to my classroom early to get set up and started. And as I turned the corner, I see that my classroom had been vandalized with words of hate, 
words associating me with terrorism. I had ISIS uh, written on my door, and I just could not believe what I was seeing. Because the majority of the students that I work with were also students of color, students who are English language learners, uh, students who are undocumented. And so they also had lots of, you know, they also experienced stereotypes. Um, but for me, and you might remember what happened in November of 2016. Does anyone remember what happened in November 2016, which was right before this? Or January of, 20, uh, of 2017? Yes. Trump got elected. Um, so that kind of started a snowball effect for me to that inst instance on 9-11-2017 where I saw that my classroom had been vandalized. So I was really devastated. Um, I was not expecting that to happen. Um, and unfortunately, that was the 13th incident that had taken place on my school campus. And not just to me, but to other um, other hijabis, other staff members who work there. Um, and so I was, I was alarmed. And I was alarmed not just for how that impacts me as a staff member, but the environment that it was cultivating for other students. So what did I do? I decided to call CARE. <laughs> I had been in their Muslim Youth Leadership Program, and so I knew a lot about uh, the types of resources that they offered. Um, and so I called CARE and I said, you know, like, what do we do? And we talked about a plan um, to figure out how I could gain back the power in that situation. Excuse me, I'm having a little hijab malfunction here. And so the plan that we came up with was I decided I was going to go public with my story. And so with CARE's help, I um, basically decided to demand action of the school district, right? They are responsible for creating the systems that protect students, that protect staff, that protect our community. And so my, my story was printed on the front page of the Mercury News, which is a new organization in San Jose that November, and I decided to speak at a school board meeting um, in front of my local elected officials. Um, and specifically, what I was asking them is, what are the policies you have in place to protect us from these experiences? How are we going to respond to these experiences? Because these stereotypes are not acceptable, and in this case, resulted in a hate crime um, with my classroom being vandalized. So after that story went public, and after I spoke at the school board meeting, that's, um, well, first of all, it was terrifying. I'm not really much of a public speaker. I enjoy being in my small classroom and speaking to and working with kids, right? Um, but speaking publicly kind of created this chain reaction where I was flooded with people contacting me. Literally, I had all of these cards and emails and phone calls of both people who were, who were horrified of what was happening in our community, but also people who were like, you're making this up. What did you do to these kids to make them do this to you? And I really didn't know what to do with it. Um, but it was a lot, right? It was a lot to process. And so I needed to figure out how to use my knowledge and my experiences about stereotypes to really impact lasting change right, in the system. And so when a local position opened up on, my, on a school board in the district which I, where I live, I decided, why not? I'm going to run for that seat. And I won. And I became the first hijabi elected official in the state of California. And the reason that I did that was so that I could help write the policies that then lead to change and work with CARE on things like Muslim Day at the Capitol to advocate for bills like AB 2291, which was to help teachers get trained on responding to school bullying. And so, so here's 
that uh, article. So again, why do I share all of this with all of you? Because I know, unfortunately, each and every one of you has probably experienced a stereotype at some point in your personal experience or witnessed someone else experiencing that. Again, it's not just to Muslims. Stereotypes impact many groups of individuals. And so it's really important for us to reflect on those experiences today and think about what can we as individuals do for, to help ourselves, but also helps our community and our broader society to challenge these stereotypes. This was just a image of the NPR article where I didn't know I was gonna be sworn in, but I was sworn in to take that uh, position on the school board. So with that, I want to give you guys some ch a chance to process what your own experiences are. So each of you should have a post-it on your table. Do you all see those? So what you're going to do is you're going to think about what are some, what is a stereotype that you have personally experienced? Um, it could be, and there's, I'm gonna go through a couple of different examples of what those, um, what those can look like, because there's actually different types or different ways that you can experience stereotypes. And I'll give you a couple of those. So I'm not sure actually if I can write this down, maybe. It might just might be helpful. That way you can think about, because there's actually different types, um, and I think it would be helpful. You might be familiar with a lot of these, right? Um, like a slur. How many of you have been called or heard someone be called a slur before? A slur is a derogatory term to, meant to demean a person or a group of people based on that stereotype about your identity. Raise your hand if you've ever experienced a slur or seen someone or heard someone be called a slur before. Yeah, so a lot of you, right? Um, so that's one like example that's kind of easy. So when I um, came to my classroom, there was quite a number of slurs kind of written uh, on my walls of my classroom. So that was one of those experiences of a specific stereotype. The other examples, um, I guess I'll just read them out loud and then if you have questions about a specific example, let me know. We have an encounter. Jarring experiences where your social reality or constraints are made real. We have microaggression. It's a brief and commonplace daily verbal, behavioral, or environmental indignities, whether intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative racial slights and insults towards people of color. Now, microaggressions are actually really important to understand that they are created out of an environment where racism exists. So this, I only learned this recently, but for example, a person who does not have, who already is in a position of power, they are the ones who can microaggress towards another person with less power. It doesn't always work the other way, or it doesn't work the other way around. So if you are in a position of power and you are using that position to abuse um, and to stereotype someone else, that is a microaggression. It has to do with that power. I talked about a slur, which is a derogatory term used to demean people based to stereotype on their identity. A stereotype threat, when you avoid acting a certain way because you might fulfill a stereotype about your identity. Um, some examples of this is like you don't want to be the angry Muslim in a, in a protest or um, you're concerned about being too loud. Like I know when I get on the plane sometimes, I'm, I get a little bit embarrassed or like nervous of if my dad or my, oh, actually, I'll give a better example of this. A little tangent here, but my husband and I went to visit waterfalls in South America, and he decides he's just so overtaken by the waterfalls that he starts doing the adhan, and I'm, like, freaking out because I'm, like, we are going to, like, people are going to think we're doing something, and, like, I was freaking out about it, but that's, you know, like, me, that was me, like, acting based on that, like, thinking people were going to think us of a, as a threat. Um, identity contingencies, when you think or act a certain way based on a stereotype of your identity. So things like Muslim girls should be quiet, all Muslims must become doctors or engineers or lawyers. Some of those are also cultural stereotypes, um, but you get the idea. So those are some examples for you to reflect on right now as you think about what to write on your post-it. Just so you kind of know, 
you're not going to be sharing your own stereotype out loud, but we will be exchanging them so that you'll randomly get to read someone else's stereotype. So just keep that in mind as you're writing this. Um, write something that you're comfortable sharing, even if it's not associated with you directly. It'll kind of help us give us more examples. Okay, so again, you have your post-it note. Go ahead and write an example. Um, it could be any of the categories of stereotypes that I've already shared, um, of an encounter, a microaggression, a slur, a time where you felt you had to act a certain way or avoid acting a certain way because of a stereotype about your identity. So I'll give you a couple minutes to do that on the post-it note. So we'll go ahead and, Hadra, can you start with yours, please? Um, mine says microaggressions at school. Okay. Thank you. Um, it says my friend was called a terrorist. Yeah. Um, mine says the day a kid called me an out an outsider and go back to your own country. Yeah, you read what they wrote. It says the concept that a woman's place in the world is to stay at home and do household chores. Thank you for reading that. Um, someone calling me a terrorist as a joke in seventh grade. Um, mine says that um, people thought that I was Indian when, then I, uh, when I told them that I was um, Pakistani, they labeled me as someone who's not proud enough of their ethnicity. Um, being associated with terrorism constantly just because one is Muslim. Um, they said two times I've been flipped off for being a different race or hijabi, and one, the first time was when a guy was kept staring at me weirdly and making me uncomfortable and then just flipped me off. And then the second time when we were crossing the road, another guy flipped us off even though it was our turn to walk. Uh, mine says uh, bombing slash terrorist jokes. Um, one of my friends joined about me being a terrorist and blowing up the school. Um, mine says being careful. I think it says about praying um, in school. Um, it's not safe. You can just do your best. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Uh, mine says explosion jokes when a Muslim enters a room and pieces of media like Call of Duty that cycle out various vaguely Arab terrorist antagonists. I don't have one, so I presume there's a discrepancy between the amount of sticky notes and the kids. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your flexibility. Uh, someone told my friend Falafel, go back to your country. Yeah. He called him a Falafel. <laughs> That's an interesting one. <clears throat> uh, like, if someone finds like a rude Muslim from our community, they would like generalize that all Muslims are that way. Uh, getting called a terrorist because I was Muslim. Also, getting called a nerd because I was Indian. Uh, mine says, avoiding voicing my opinions and fear of being considered loud and obnoxious to give in to the stereotype of being the quiet Muslim girl. Uh, someone yelled, Allahu Akbar, when we were learning about 9-11 in class. Stereotype, one example of this is often in school. I avoid talking about academics or grades a lot. So I don't fulfill that stereotype towards Asians. Mine says being called a Wahhabi. Uh, mine is was called a bomber after my class learned what 9-11 was and was called the N-word. Um, uh, their father was praying at the summit of a hike and they were afraid of what other people would think. 
this one says someone was called a suicide bomber. Mine says Muslims are terrorists. It says, I have been called a terrorist, and even though I know nobody has actually meant it, I still don't like being called that. People singing happy birthday on 9-11. Uh, being told 9-11 should be my holiday. Um, mine says, I personally faced slurs many times, microaggressions many times, multiple encounters, times when I felt I should change how I act, times when I was... Um, I don't know how to read that. But. That's okay. And much more. Thank you for sharing. So I think we would all agree, right, that experiencing stereotypes is not the best feeling. It actually really sucks. Um, but there's a lot of ways, there's a lot of, and I shouldn't say, but there's, and there's a lot of way, different ways that we experience it. Some have to do with um, our Muslim identity, our identity as Muslims, and others have to do with all other aspects of um, your identity. So when we think about um, stereotypes, it's really important to think about the many, many different realms, and we heard a lot of good examples of that, of the ways that stereotypes can impact us. Um, and, but the other important thing to understand is stereotypes, although they really suck, they also impact a lot more than just our feelings. And what do I mean by that? So when we talk about the day-to-day -day incidents, a lot of times these incidents, they just become like part of the new normal. They become normalized, right? Like, oh, this is like, yeah, this happened today. It sucks. And it's probably going to happen at some point in the future. Um, but what happens is when it becomes part of our daily lives, as Muslims, for black people, for immigrants, for women, when they become part of this idea that it's no big deal, that's when the problem of stereotypes impacts a person's sense of belonging in society and also starts to impact the policies and the system that are being made by the decision makers. And I would say especially when the people who are sitting at the table making these decisions are not reflective of the people who are experiencing these types of things. So what I would like for us to do now is we're actually going to do um, a little bit of deeper thinking on what we call, I know someone had the definition, but the knowledge power. Um, yes. I think we should be able to. I got them. Okay. Oops. Let's see this is a little. Okay. So we got this one a lot. I actually heard this example quite a bit, but Muslims are terrorists, right? That's a, a pretty common stereotype. So we're going to use this tool. We've got our knowledge, policies, and then real-world consequences. So this knowledge, right, this concept that Muslims are terrorists, people are getting that from a variety of different places. Yes. So again, if, if you need to take care of yourself for whatever reason, you all are young, uh, independent individuals, please feel free to take care of your, yourself and your needs. Um, so again, knowledge. We're getting that from lots of different places. Um, this tool is going to help us understand how oppression operates on different levels. So the first level of oppression is knowledge. And knowledge is that information that individuals are getting um, and how they're perpetuated. So stereotypes are perpetuated by mass media by culture, by education, um, and other platforms. And it's the way that people understand the world, and that impacts then the decision makers, the people who are making the policies, which then also leads to how those policies have consequences in people's real lives. Um, so we'll start with this example. 
Muslims are terrorists. I want you to give some examples of some policies, right? Um, some policies that have, that also, um, that impact people's day-to-day -day lives as a result of this, right? How many of you, I know just recently, I'll go on a little tangent, yes. The travel ban, yeah, that's a great example. So what you'll do is you're gonna turn and talk about some of those policies with your partner sitting next to you, talk about some of the policies, um, and we'll go ahead and we'll write them up. So I wanna give you, hopefully you'll be, you'll be prepared where if you don't know something, maybe you can share it with your partner, and then we'll generate a list of ideas together. Okay, so again, that's a, an example of an actual policy um, that's impacted by this Muslims are terrorists. Okay, so go ahead and go and turn and talk, and then I'm gonna collect some ideas from you on policies that influence. And come back together, and then I know we, Brother Osman's going to bring the microphone around for you um, to share what the policy is that you guys discussed. Okay? So, who's ready? I know one of them we had was the travel ban. So, I'll start with that one. That's a policy. Okay, who has another example of a policy, whether shared by you or your partner? Yes, we'll wait for the mic so anyone on the recording can hear also. Thank you. Um, stricter immigration policies or just the making the policy of becoming a citizenship much harder. Okay, you, the first part was strict immigration laws, okay. And maybe I would also add, right, that they're not always the most um, equitable immigration laws, right? Thank you for sharing that. Yes. Uh, does it have to be in America only? No. Um, well, I'm not sure if this is true, but I heard in India they're now trying to ban the hijab. Oops. Yeah. On hijab, and I would say, right, a lot of other... Um, like the burkini in France too, there's lots of like controlling of what Muslim women specifically wear. Yes, we have another one. Thank you for sharing. Uh, like the TSA and like searching Muslims over and over again and keeping them in a security levels in the airport, et cetera. Yeah. I'm gonna say TSA searches. Yeah, that, the extra special treatment, right? As you go through the airport. Other examples of policies or ways that um, we have actual legislation or, or laws or systems in place based on this concept or this knowledge. You could even think broader too, like in terms of in the world, um, what are things that our laws or other policies. So I'll give you some other examples. How many of you have heard of Guantanamo Bay? Yeah, so policies where people are unjustly and without a fair or due process taken and detained for years of their life, right? That is an example. Other examples. This might, well, this might have been a little bit before your time, or maybe you've heard of it, but the war on terror, right? This concept that we can go and invade other countries just because we feel like they're more of a threat than others. Okay. Um, and then also similarly, right, with, with immigration, I would also say things like the actual process to become a citizen, oftentimes that can be delayed or unjustly uh, ruled on based on a, this, this concept, right? 
So this is just to give you an idea of what are ways that this actually has an impact, right? It may seem like, okay, yeah, that was in Call of Duty, you know, where they're associating Muslims with terrorism by incorporating like this violence with actual Arabic terms or words that sound similar to Arabic. But these actually have impacts on the types of policies and systems that are created. And then unfortunately, what's even worse is that these policies then have real world consequences. So that's what I want us to think about also. Go ahead and turn and talk really quickly about what are some real consequences of all of these policies or other things that you think of, of when this knowledge is perpetuated, remember we were talking about it becomes normalized, it becomes part of our day to day. What are the real world consequences of that? I, I might have accidentally mentioned some of them too, but what are some real world consequences of these policies? Go ahead and turn and talk. Um, so I do remember there was this time a while back, a uh, hijabi a Muslim woman tried to go on a trip that she paid for um, in a plane, but they tried to make her take off her hijab in public and she refused to, so they didn't let her go on the trip that she paid for. Yeah, so actual innocent Muslims, right? Everyday Muslims who are being detained. Thank you for sharing, yes. Um, refugees trapped in war zones because of like the travel ban. Yeah. Um, I had an example of somebody I know who um, their first and last name were just happened to be on like a suspect list after 9-11. Um, and as you guys know, like Muslim names tend to be common. Um, so she wasn't allowed to travel and she had a lot of restrictions just because of this, even though she never did a single thing. Um, and there was like nothing on her criminal records at all. Yeah, so being restricted, right? Having your basic rights, that's the impact, the real world consequence. Oops. Other examples? Oh, yes. Um, so like the war on terror invasions in Iraq and Afghanistan, a lot of innocent civilians died and it was mainly because it was a Muslim majority country. Yeah, that's a huge one, right? This actually impacts people's lives, like literally, as in people are being killed. That's an actual real world consequence, yeah. Um, I said that generally, as like a society, when these things happen, like for example, a ban on hijab or TSA searches, when people see these, it gets ingrained in their brains, you know, naturally that, oh, these things are bad, or like a hijab would be bad, or like Muslim people are more suspicious, that kind of stuff. Yes, you bring up such a great point, is that these consequences now start to impact again, it's a cycle. It's now perpetuating that Muslims are terrorists, right? It's getting so ingrained that people are, it, it's, it's a constant cycle. Yes, thank you for sharing that. Um, when something happens in like a, uh, to like a Muslim group, uh, a lot of the time it's seen as less important than it's happened to a non-Muslim group. So for example, like in Ukraine, like it's completely terrible what's happening there. But when the same stuff was happening in Yemen or Syria, uh, it didn't receive nearly as much attention uh, because it wasn't like a Western ally. And also like what's happening in Palestine where um, the Palestinian people and the governments are painted as terrorists uh, because they're trying to, you know, for the most part, defend themselves uh, from the occupying powers of Israel. So like generally like the stereotype will make most, like, you know, Muhammad said, the Muslim cause is less, uh, uh, less serious in the media's eye. Yeah. And I would argue that that's actually very deeply dehumanizing. When you are taking away the value of individuals' life on the basis that they're Muslim or on other basis, right, it's dehumanizing them. It's, it's stripping them of not only their rights, but of their right to exist, right? Thank you for sharing that. Okay, so again, I want you to think about when this also starts to impact this. 
are there other things that sometimes, like, again, make this worse? Like, when is this reinforced in a way amongst Muslims, for instance, or individuals who may call themselves Muslims but have different actions? What else helps, unfortunately, helps perpetuate this? Yes. Yeah, unfortunately, that is a real world consequence, right? Is when so called Muslims who, who claim Islam is the reason why they're doing this, groups like ISIS, right? That's a real world consequence, unfortunately. And they're also helping perpetuate this again, right? So they, it's the creation of these groups. So hopefully that makes sense, kind of how we have, we're so ingrained in the society where, where this is perpetuated in so many ways. And then it creates these policies that help, that continue to, are again, are building on this knowledge, but now it's actually like in laws and in systems, which then has actual consequences on individuals' lives, and it just keeps repeating. So what we're going to do is... Um, well, let's think about this. Let me ask one more question. How does knowing this affect the way that we address the oppression? Like, how does knowing that there's policies, that this is, yes, we're, we're living in a day-to-day -day life where this knowledge is perpetuated, but then it's created in policies and then has real-world consequences. How do we know how does knowing this affect the way that we address oppression? Any thoughts on that? Do we need more processing time? Okay, turn and talk to your partner because then I'm going to ask or I might have to call on someone. Turn and talk. I'll say the question again. How does knowing how this affects people, what does that tell us about the way that we address oppression? What are we learning from this? What do we need to do now as a result of this? And turn talk. All right, hopefully you've got an idea of how this affects the way that we start to address this oppression. Who wants to share? Yes. Wait for the mic on this side. So one would be to stop those policies from being implemented by being active at wherever those they're being legislated. And then also to maybe spread and enforce positive knowledge to kind of create this counter effect of, oh, they're good people. And yeah, kind of you bring song. up two really important points, right? Being a part of this, right, the decision-making process when these policies are formed, and also this concept of dawah, right? We have to be able to share the positive aspects of our faith and help counteract this knowledge that's being perpetuated. Thank you for sharing that. Other examples of how do we stop this system of oppression? Yes. Um, I said that we should always try to represent Islam in a 
in a good light and so that the people around us that are maybe, you know, that maybe are viewing these policies that was at like as what Islam actually is, they think that it's, you know, like Muslims are terrorists. We should, you know, try to kind of like that counteract that by representing Islam in a good light and always being like at our best behavior when we're trying to represent our religion. Yeah, it's so important to embody that knowledge, right? Again, helping make sure there's that the correct knowledge about there and the best way for people to experience that. I mean, that's how in your day-to-day -day life you're learning, you're representing that in a lot of ways uh, by sharing that knowledge and sharing that. Thank you. Yes. We have Brother Isman bringing the mic real quick. Thank you for your patience. Um, I just wanted to mention that um, because we see it's such a clear cycle, it's essential to not. Um, have Muslim people um, like reacting in a way that's like fueling it more um, and just, just like something that came to my mind was when um, something like very crude had been drawn about the Prophet Sallam. I think it was um, kind of recently and then a man reacted with violence and it you know the attention was on the man who reacted not the actual action done itself that was very wrong and offensive to you know us Muslims so yeah. right so much of the the real world consequence of our actions that we also have to be mindful of thank you for sharing that so again we have to be able to counteract that oppression at all levels that's how we break this cycle is making sure that we are yes have the knowledge to be able to respond even when it seems like something small like a microaggression right and then yes, certainly at the larger level with our policies and systems, and then also speaking up and making the connection and helping other people make the connections when it's having real impacts, um, real world consequences on people's lives. Um, so again, we'll think about, and we'll think about this one a little bit more, um, maybe a little bit later on. But what we're going to do now is, remember I said we're, we're learning about this as Muslims, right? Because that's one thing that all of us have in common. But I also want you to think about, we're gonna be thinking about how this now impacts other groups. We had a couple of examples when we did the, the posted activity, but you're actually gonna get a chance now to do a deep dive with, on a specific other group of individuals and the way that they experience stereotypes. So you'll have your own chart of the knowledge, again, what the knowledge about a specific group that's being perpetuated. What are the policies that exist in our, in our society that impact, that are impacted by that stereotype? And then what are the, the real world consequences that that group, uh, again, is experiencing as a result of this cycle? So what we'll go ahead and do is you'll each, we'll have about five groups. Um, and we'll look at the dominant narratives for each of those. Your group will have, um, your group will um, each be focusing on one of those dominant narratives, right? The knowledge that's being perpetuated. So we'll have a couple of um, examples. I'll actually go ahead and read these out loud. So we have the dominant narratives are black men are thugs. Immigrants are stealing our jobs. Poor people are lazy. Women are overly emotional and irrational. Asians are a model minority. So I'm going to give you guys about, we'll get, do 10 minutes to start in your groups. And then based on that, you're actually going to be sharing with the larger group what you come up with in your chart. Okay. Um, and you'll need someone to kind of, unless you want to do it, tag team it. But you need someone who's going to be sharing that information uh, as you guys uh, brainstorm on your pieces of paper. So we'll do groups. We'll do five groups. So I guess if there's like, yeah, okay. Okay, six. Yes. Okay, so we can do numbers. I know you guys are probably going to be like, no. <laughs> but six groups, right? Six groups or five? Five groups. Five groups. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to number you off so that you get a chance to interact with some different people. Okay. So just remember your number. One, two, 
three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three.